that's an interesting presentation as the founder of a roll-ups of service company to go afterwards. Uh, also, um, if anyone saw that slide, I am not the co-inventor of ZK Sync. Just, just to uh, keep that clear. Um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, Caldera, our involvement with Celestia, um, how we're unleashing rollups with DA networks, um, and also just want to talk about some of the motivation behind application-specific rollups, why you might want to build them, why we are personally still bullish on RAS, and why we think it might make sense for some applications. Um, so I'm just going to take you through a journey of some of our thinking around this, and then uh, talk through our involvement with Celestia and our recent developments there. Um, so yeah, first of all, Matt, founder of Caldera, caldera.xyz, come check us out. Um, we are the easiest way to launch a dedicated rollup for your application, project, or ecosystem. We're also the first, as far as I know, rollups as a service company uh, to go multi-stack. And so we you know, really emphasize developer choice. We support uh, optimism OP stack chains. We also support Arbitrum Orbit chains, with many more coming in the pipeline soon. We also focus on being an infrastructure layer for modular chains. So we know how hard it is for people to launch viable blockchains, and that doesn't stop at just the sequencer. Um, so we aim to provide all sorts of different infrastructure. And we're also a white glove service. We are a RAS, very nebulous uh, definition, um, but we are one of a few companies that is defined that way. Um, oh, it looks like our emojis didn't, didn't render. That's all right. Imagine beautiful emojis there chosen by ChatGPT as well. Um, we do reliable sequencer hosting. That's a huge component of it, of course. Um, you know, having reliable RPCs, making sure that the sequencer doesn't go down, uh, making sure that Archival data is available to users. That's a major unlock, and that's one of the more annoying things about uh, you know for folks who are trying to launch their own rollup. Uh, we also do all sorts of additional infra, as I mentioned, like block explorers, RPCs, interfaces for bridging. Like we've actually found that is in some sense like a lot of the value add that we provide. Um, you know, teams. There are some teams that are able to get started with the rollup sequencer, but they still lean on us on all that additional infrastructure and value added services that we provide as a cloud provider and as well dedicated support. We found you know, we are probably the top of funnel for most teams that are thinking about application specific chains or ecosystem specific chains. And so we know best uh, what people want, what people need, and, and the problems that people are thinking through as they're you know, making these decisions. And so oftentimes when we're working with teams, we're working with them as a thought partner as they think through these major decisions. Um, so yeah, I first wanted to motivate just why build with an app rollup. And I wanted to start from the very beginning um, in the beginning, there is Ethereum, and Ethereum was good, but Ethereum is also slow. Um, whenever I talk about uh, the speed of Ethereum, I always include this photo of the Altair 8800. I personally am too young to have ever actually used one, um, but this is a personal computer from the mid-1970s, and the thing about this computer, it's probably the closest uh, in terms of instructions per second. It's the closest uh, comparable to Ethereum mainnet. So both this Altera 8800 and Ethereum mainnet can process about 0.2 million instructions per second in total across their virtual machines. Now, unlike the Altera 8800, which is a personal computer, basically single-threaded, only running you know, a single application at, at any time, uh, Ethereum is probably the worst cloud multi-tenant infrastructure ever, where you have hundreds of thousands of applications that are all competing for scarce computational resources on top of them. And so that leads to high fees. Um, this uh, graph was a little bit cherry-picked. You might notice it stops uh, in 2021. But uh, for those who are around there, probably most of you, uh, you remember when fees really spiked. And like as demand gets higher, fees get super high, and the most interesting applications get priced out of chains like Ethereum. Um, and uh, another thing is Ethereum is ossified, or Ethereum is in the process of ossifying. Ethereum as this like global base layer computer for you know the world's new financial system, like Ethereum cannot move fast and break things. Ethereum needs to be ultra conservative. And for anyone who has done anything in the EIP process, you know this to be the case. Um, it's basically impossible to make changes to Ethereum, and, and especially breaking changes are impossible. And this is like generally a very, very good thing um, for Ethereum. But if you're building certain types of applications, you might want to make changes. And that might motivate you to build your own chain. As well, this. Uh, is true of most L2s that are being built on Ethereum right now. So if you've talked with anyone from these general purpose L2 chains, whether it's Optimism, Arbitrum, or any of the ZK teams, the holy grail is Ethereum equivalence. Basically saying, like, we want our rollups to behave from a VM perspective in the same way Ethereum does. And that makes sense for them as well, because they're motivated to 
produce chains that are effectively successors to Ethereum's general purpose mission. Um, but that might not be what you want if you're building an application with specific requirements. And so even if general purpose L2s are solving the first you know, two problems of speed and cost, um, they're still relatively ossified. You know, they're, they're going to wait for Ethereum to make changes to the VM before they make major breaking changes as well. Um, and so that leads to why you want, might, you might want to launch a dedicated chain. Uh, again, emoji uh, not rendering. Um, but you have dedicated TPS. You have a dedicated lane to scale. Um, and that TPS is all yours. Again, going back to that multi-tenancy point, you're not having resource contention between uh, all of, you know, a bunch of applications all on one chain. You have either just the applications of your ecosystem or your own application on that chain. You also have ultra low fees. You can explore the trade-off space um, where you settle, where you post DA, uh, et cetera, um, to get the best fees for your application. I mean, in the last presentation, there's a lot of calculation around fees. Th that calculation is legitimate, but all of those variables are configurable. And so when you're building a dedicated chain, you get to choose what the inputs are to that function and then find you know, the outputs that make sense for you. Lastly, there's latency. I think latency is uh, a really, really underappreciated aspect uh, when you're building Web3 applications. Um, I spent some time in the gaming industry. When you're in the gaming industry, if your application has like over 100 milliseconds of latency, people like go into your DMs and your email like telling you to kill yourself. Blockchain, that's not the case. Um, you know, you have relatively high block times. Users are used to that. But if you're building on-chain social or you're building on-chain gaming, like you might actually really want ultra low latency and being able to choose where you sit on that sequencer decentralization spectrum might be really helpful for that. Uh, also, there's customization. At the first order, there's precompiles, right? A lot of these precompiles might be very useful. They've also languished for quite some time. Um, us specifically, we work with a team who was waiting for years on the BLS curve operations precompile to get merged. You can find their CTO has comments on that. Uh, that EIP back from like four or five years ago. They were waiting on it, they, they needed it, it was what would, would have been most you know, helpful for them to develop their application. Uh, it's not getting merged into Ethereum anytime soon, it's pretty stale. Um, we're able to merge it into their rollup, get that set up, and then they were able to go live like a couple weeks after. Uh, and so there's there are a bunch of other really interesting ones too, like the Poseidon hash function, ZK friendly hash function. But it's not just EIPs and it's not just custom precompiles, you have basically full control over the state machine. So eventually, we're going to be able to support different VMs, like the Solana VM, the Move VM, you know, whatever crazy VMs or custom uh, state transition functions people might want to do. Uh, there's also value capture. Um, imagine a, a token emoji. Over there, you can use a custom token. Um, you can generate sequencer fees. You can also run some like lightweight MEV. And so you can choose how to monetize. And especially right now, where a lot of projects are thinking about how to make money, um, this is a super important aspect. Uh, a lot of teams um, are thinking more and more about this. How can they take fees uh, from their rollup? How do they distribute that back to their community? How do they use that to fund development? Um, and there are going to be a lot of really, really interesting models on this going forward. Um, Lastly, uh, wanted to defend settled rollups a little bit. Um, we think that uh, the rollup space and the modular space in general is going to be a homecoming moment for a lot of these application chains to come back into the fold with Ethereum via rollup stacks. That's not to say that we're anti-sovereign rollup. We think it makes sense for certain applications, makes less sense for others. But we're really uh, into this idea of a hub and spoke, L2s and L3s, all eventually settled by and uh, settling to and secured by Ethereum, and also having native composability with Ethereum assets and access to liquidity on Ethereum L1s, uh, Ethereum L1 and other Ethereum L2s, and eventually L3s. Um, so there's this wonderful quote from Vitalik: uh, "Pression is always back from 2021," um, and this is. We're really, really aligned with this thesis. We get a multi-rollup future for Ethereum, which is effectively the Cosmos multi-chain vision, but it's on top of a shared base layer, uh, providing data availability and shared security. That's what he said. What you might notice uh, in that data availability point is that we haven't fully gotten there yet. Um, Ethereum, when we're using Ethereum for DA, we're just posting data to Ethereum call data. That is not super efficient, it's quite costly, and it's leading some, to some big limitations when it comes to rollups. Uh, so yeah, that's the major blocker. Um, when you're running a rollup on Ethereum, you have a bunch of costs, and then you have DA uh, as a major bottleneck. Um, you can split up costs into three buckets. 
the off-chain infrastructure costs, this is like your cloud servers, your hosting, networking, et cetera, that is relatively fixed and also something that can't really change that much. Um, you have on-chain fixed costs. There's a little bit of cost in settlement. There's also a fixed cost when it comes to DA. So a lot of these roll-up stacks, they're posting a lot of data uh, to Ethereum, just like empty blocks, uh, kind of like metadata for the chain, um, even if there are no transactions being processed. And that was talked about in the last presentation as well. And it is a major blocker for people who are launching app chains, where they might be trying to bootstrap a little bit of activity, but you know that activity hasn't come yet. They don't have guarantees that there will be people around to pay for fees and cover costs. Um, and so you know they are wondering, how do they cover those costs? Uh, and then there are the variable costs, so posting transaction data that gets sent to the sequencer. Um, and then there's a major bottleneck, which is data availability. Uh, we can quickly go through them. Um, these costs are really killer. Uh, they make it hard to get off the ground, as I mentioned. Um, when you're settling on Ethereum, you might pay $100,000 per year in these fixed DA, like metadata costs. That uh, is based off of current calculations. So if we have another bull run or gas prices get higher, greater demand for block space, that number can go up. Um, they also prevent rollups from being strictly like cost competitive or better on cost than alt ones um, For like simple uh, transactions, sometimes uh, there might be cost competitiveness depending on demand on all of these chains. Um, but as you can see, like generally for average transactions, um, a lot of these alt ones are still slightly better uh, than existing rollups. And that's gonna you know, harm adoption because users really, they don't really care. They don't really know the difference between a side chain and an L2. Uh, a lot of the times, Users and even application developers want to go wherever it's cheapest, wherever there's adoption, uh, et cetera. They're not super aligned with Ethereum in general. Um, and lastly, and I think this is an underappreciated point about the current Ethereum roll-up space and the status quo, is that we do have a DA bottleneck, which limits the total throughput across all roll-ups that are currently built on top of Ethereum. Um, these are some calculations, kind of rough, back of the napkin math uh, from uh, Calvin Victor, who works at Optimism. He has a blog post called TPS is Dumb. This was a little bit of a sidebar um, on that blog post, but basically, you know, even assuming like relatively, uh, you know, reasonable uh, assumptions around call data compression, et cetera, like current Ethereum DA only supports 360 transactions per second, and that's if we're using all of the Ethereum's network, all of the gas throughput, just for posting call data for L2s, um, and this is like based off of uh, the current network, so pre 4844, pre dank sharding. Um, but this is global um, across all rollups. So even though uh, for the compute, we can horizontally scale Ethereum right now via rollups, eventually we're going to run into this bottleneck. And so if you look at a lot of these limitations, you'll find the thing that we keep going back to is DA. Right? A lot of these on-chain fixed costs are actually DA, which is uh, surprising to some people because DA is often thought as the, as the variable cost, but there's still a ton of metadata that needs to get posted to Ethereum. Uh, there are uh, relatively high variable costs. You're paying DA when you're sending transactions. And of course, there is this bottleneck when it comes to DA limiting the total throughput of all Ethereum rollups. Uh, and so uh, we have our saviors, um, all of whom I believe are sponsored to this event, Celestia, uh, Eigen, and Avail, basically projects that are focused on providing cheap data availability. And at Caldera, we were founded, we were really, you know, even since founding, like we were really excited about these. We saw these uh, projects as, as being the major uh, unlocks for an Ethereum-centric roll-up future. Um, and so we were one of the first teams to integrate Alt-DA into traditional Ethereum roll-up stacks. Um, so with Celestia, we launched uh, the first testnet of an OP stack plus Celestia roll-up. And effectively, you know, at a very high level, what it does is like we're posting data frames to Celestia now rather than Ethereum natively. Um, thus, you know, Alt-DA. And we're only posting references to those frames that are posted on Celestia to Ethereum. So that means that we're turning that variable cost, which was uh, sending all that data to Ethereum DA, into a fixed cost. We're just sending a reference. Um, this is a, a diagram from, uh, from Vitalik's blog. Um, just wanted to put this here to say, we're not really changing much of the rollup protocol at all. You know, we're still posting state routes to the rollup contract. We're still posting batches. The only thing that changes is, I was told not to uh, stray too far away from uh, there, but we'll live, um, is this part. Uh, so these transactions, that data is being sent to Celestia. There's a little bit of, uh, of changes made uh, in this logic to post references, um, but effectively the rollup protocol is still the same. 
we're just referencing data on Celestia rather than Ethereum. Um, and it's live. So if you guys want to be some of the first uh, to launch something and play around with an OP stack plus Celestia testnet, you can go to our bubstestnet.com. Or, and we'd, we're also really excited about this, we recently launched a testnet with Manta Network. And these guys are super early adopters. Yeah, they're great. There's Kenny in the back from Manta Network. Um, they're, as far as I know, the earliest adopter of Celestia plus OP stack for rollups on Ethereum. So they're going to allow their users to experience way lower transaction costs than any existent rollup on Ethereum. Plus, they've also integrated a lot of ZK-friendly uh, application level ZK functions. And so if you're interested in developing on uh, the first network to use Celestia for DA, go check them out, go talk to them. They've got a strong presence at this event, so find them afterwards. Um, and yeah, thanks. Uh, feel free to contact me at any time. If you're thinking about launching a rollup, if you just want to talk about the design space, always happy to chat. Um, and yeah, stay tuned. I, uh, you're not rid of me yet. We're doing a panel here uh, on the rollups of service space, which I'm told might get spicy. So stay tuned. Thanks.